Hi, and welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Andrew Strindberg, and today I'm here to talk with uh, the executive director of CHDS, Ted Lewis, about his new book, Back Sandpile. Ted, welcome. Thank you, Anders. Glad to be here. This is a book about the dynamics of catastrophes. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, this is work that goes back to the 1980s with uh, Per Bach. This is why the title includes his name. Um, per Bach was sort of the original catastrophe guy, and he came up with this theory that uh, catastrophes behave like sand piles. And sand piles, as you know, uh, they build up in a conical shape, and then eventually there's landslides, and they collapse. And so this is, over the years, this has become a metaphor for all kinds of collapses and catastrophes that happen in the natural world, like hurricanes, earthquakes, terrorist attacks, epidemics, um, lots of different things having to do with homeland security issues in particular, but also uh, the society in general. So at the center of all of this is a concept called self-organized criticality. Right. Self-organized criticality is a kind of uh, tension that builds up in complex systems that <clears throat> causes them to fail. Um, and the more self-organized criticality there is, the bigger the, the crash, the bigger the failure. So an example would be the 2008 uh, financial meltdown that we just experienced a couple of years ago. This is a classic exa example of a sand pile that for a period of perhaps 20 years, the financial system built up the self-organized criticality. And then when actually a rather uh, small incident with a failure in a savings and loan company in Southern California sort of tripped this sand pile and caused it to go through a major collapse, the largest financial collapse in the last 21 years. So it's our tendency or will urge to improve, to, to effectivize that causes self-organized criticality. Right. One, one interesting thing about my approach, because uh, Bach had been written about many in many other books, but one of the approaches I took was his, what I consider his complete theory, not just the theory of the sand piles, but what causes them and what uh, um, Bach called punctuated uh, equilibrium, which means that in uh, Bach's view, uh, these collapses are actually necessary. Uh, without them, you don't have progress. So what happens is we go through cycles. We go through a built up of self-organized criticality and then, we, then things collapse. And the reason we do that, according to Bach, is because we, in modern societies, we are interested in efficiencies and optimization. So we take out all the surge capacity out of these systems. So we have just-in-time inventory systems or we have uh, hospitals without surge capacity or uh, electric power grids without surge capacity or uh, tele telecom systems that are very efficient and optimal but without surge capacity. So, so this is uh, uh, sort of the cause of self-organized criticality. And it also spreads into the political realm, right? Spreads into the political realm. A couple of interesting counter uh, intuitive ideas in the book is that uh, the in terms of catastrophes, you want uh, what are called uh, short-tailed catastrophes, that is, the likelihood of really bad things uh, to be very un to uh, go down, actually, rather than increase. But in terms of innovation and political things, sometimes you want a long tail. You want these highly unlikely things, which um, are called black swans by Taleb. You want these things to actually occur more frequently. We want more Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, but we want less hurricanes and floods in the Mississippi River. So we want to have these short-tailed events rather than the, the black swans. And we uh, contribute to black swans when we optimize. This seems to run counter to the way things are done, both in politics and business. Yes, and in fact, in the electric power grid, if you increase the reliability of the components, you actually uh, cause the outages to be bigger. So the 2003 outage, for example, would be considered a black swan. And, 
And this is work done by uh, scientists, not by me, but I describe it in the book. But uh, the um, size of the black swans actually grows when you make things, the compounds that go into the system more reliable. Another example is the uh, SARS epidemic, which uh, spread throughout the world. It was, was the first pandemic of the 21st century. And rather than asking why did this happen, I asked why did it stop? Because SARS actually started and burned out essentially in about an eight month period of time. And the, the popular wisdom is that uh, pandemics are more likely to happen because of uh, air travel, modern air travel, which is spread, tends to spread uh, contagions throughout the world. But I, but in my book, I describe why these things don't happen. Actually, the, there's a theory proposed by researchers in Beijing Normal University that I describe in the book that claims that uh, air travel, particularly long distance air travel, is the reason why these pandemics actually stop and they don't succeed. And they can apply this also to uh, terrorist uh, organizations. And that theory is uh, somewhat mathematical, but it kind of, it kind of makes sense because as contagions take big jumps from one country to the next, they become diluted, they become weaker, and they tend to die out. So actually, if you wanted to start something like the Black Plague of the um, Middle Ages in Europe, it, ha it has to move slowly, and it has to be local rather than uh, long distance, like you would experience with uh, air travel. And you also apply this to internet viruses. Internet viruses are a classic case of uh, epidem epidemic spreading through networks. And uh, we know, for example, that uh, viruses spread very quickly through the internet because of the structure of the internet. It, it tends to have many hubs, uh, hubs being uh, uh, websites or, or services that are highly connected, have lots of connections with other, other hubs. And this is also uh, true in uh, human populations because uh, people with lots of social relationships tend to be super spreaders of diseases. So the same thing happens in the internet, which uh, leads you to a kind of interesting uh, countermeasure. If you wanted to reduce the uh, amount of damage done by viruses on the internet, instead of putting uh, antiviral software on your personal computer, you would Put, you would uh, put more effort and hardening into the servers themselves. And of course there are fewer than uh, about 100 uh, really big servers in the uh, global internet. So you really want to apply the treatment to roughly 100 computer systems in, in the world. So what can we do about this? Um, how does one optimize without optimizing? Well, the, the remedies are not very desirable because it actually suggests that you run these complex systems suboptimally. That you, instead of trying to maximize the profit from the electric power grid, you try to uh, suboptimize it. That is, you, you, ha you run it at uh, less than optimal performance because that gives you a surge capacity. And with surge capacity, you could handle the cases when uh, everyone turns on their air conditioner simultaneously, and that kind of thing. But in, in the case of, um, let's say, the environment or the economy, you want to do the opposite. You, like, as I mentioned, when you really want to have more black swans when it comes to economic development. You want more Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, and so you actually want to do the opposite. You want to promote black swans in that case. So it depends on the situation. So is this a book for practitioners only, or who's, who's your audience with this? Well, I think this uh, has an audience of people that are interested in a different way of thinking about the world, because for the past 350 years, we've been taught to think about averages and bell curves and, and what the way things are supposed to happen in a kind of a normal world. And uh, Box Sandpile is more about uh, power laws and um, lopsided uh, distributions. And uh, when you think about uh, things such as uh, homeland security and terrorism and the economy and politics, 
If you take this sort of lopsided distribution point of view, you get different answers. You get a different way of thinking about the same problems. And what I find interesting about it is it sort of drives you into rethinking old problems in a new way. When I was reading this book, the so-called Arab Spring was going on. It, was, uh, it had spread from Tunisia to Egypt and um, it was already spreading beyond, beyond that. And I kept on seeing, um, I kept on thinking, long-tailed event, long-tailed event. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Systems, this, this, the state system here has been organized in a way that is so brittle that um, even one man, a single protester in Tunisia, sets off this, mm -hmm. this massive regional upheaval that now includes uh, at least one civil war. Uh, and and uh, and and massive massive protest in the street. Would that be a a way to think about it? Yeah, I think so. The um, uh, using this metaphor to understand politics is a rather undeveloped field, but the what you describe pretty much fits the model. If you think about it, the self-organized criticality in those societies was. Uh, to, uh, totalitarianism that kept kind of tightening the noose, right? They kept increasing the self-organized criticality by, uh, you know, removing freedoms and restricting the population. And, and as they did this, it produced uh, resentment amongst the population. And that resentment grew to what we call a critical point or a tipping point in my book. And the uh, and it didn't take much to set off the conflagration. It, it, if that same thing had happened uh, with the Tunisian vendor, say, 20 years ago, probably nothing would have changed, right? But the fact was that this, this uh, criticality had built up over a period of 20, 30 years to where this small, relatively small incident actually set things off. And so, yeah, I think it very much fits into the theory of this book. There's a fractal thing going on here as well, because you have this self-organized criticality on the level of these individual societies, mm -hmm. then the regional system as a whole, uh, but then also through the internet and um, Facebook, Twitter, all these various things, um, how it relates to the global system. I suppose a f question is, how does one run pol political systems suboptimally? Because I know you say this is an undeveloped field, but if anyone has any ideas about this, I think it might be you. Well, yeah, the American government is the most suboptimal government invented, right? Because the, the founding fathers realized that uh, they, were, they wanted uh, the government to be inefficient, right? With multiple checks and balances, um, division of power, uh, n not only you know, on vertically with federal system and state system and local system, but also across the branches of federal government with the judicial and president and Congress. And so they, they actually invented the original suboptimal government, right? So, so I don't have a con concern about uh, this happening within the United States because it's already sort of matches that uh, uh, situation. But it's a terminology that no one likes to hear, though. Right? Yeah, so it's terminology. <laughs> yeah, people don't want to hear that uh, the government's inefficient. But the reality is, uh, the federalism in the United States is pretty suboptimal already. We've heard a lot about the use of Facebook and Twitter and other uh, social media uh, in, for the purposes of these, these various uprisings, or this, this regional uprising. Do um, you have anything, any thoughts about that? What social media like Facebook and Twitter and so forth do is they build out the, net, the social network, it's, Facebook has a half a billion people, right? So that essentially increases the connectivity between the nodes and the network, where the nodes are the people and the links are the connections between them, whether they're on Facebook or whatever. A hundred years ago, we didn't have that, so the, the network is very sparse. That is, it's unlikely that you or I would have a social connection with someone in, in Europe or um, Middle East. But now it's um, now with Facebook, the connections are very thick. There's very they're very dense, right? And we know from network theory that the denser the 
linkages, the faster a contagion moves. That is, if you have a, a if it's smallpox or the measles or whatever, uh, that contagion will sweep very rapidly through a highly connected society. Well, now that the society is connected electronically and is fairly dense because of Facebook, etc., ideas and uh, decisions move not only globally, but they move faster. They're a contagion that is spread faster by all these connections. You talk in your book about how these big events, the long-tailed events, spur innovation. And you make a distinction between innovation and inventiveness. Uh, could you explain that a bit? Yeah, I, my argument in the book on innovation is that you need both. You need in, invention and innovation, where invention is the spark of a new, new idea, but innovation is actually getting it uh, into the market, getting it to spread and become mainstream. Everybody uses it. And you have lots of examples of that, Ever, everything from the original VCR recorder to iPads today, etc. So this is why I consider Steve Jobs not the inventor, but the innovator. And I talk about the inventor of television in that chapter. And, and he was unable, even though he's a smart guy, he's unable to make his version of television uh, popular enough to be in everybody's home. It took Sarnoff, the, the innovator, to actually spread that innovation. So I see these things happening hand in hand. What's interesting about invention and innov innovation to me is not all of them succeed, right? In fact, most fail. And in fact, the numbers that succeed are more like black swans. So you go back to the box sandpile an analog and say, well, are these new ideas and inventions and products, are they actually uh, collapses of the box sandpile? Only in this case, they're good collapses, right? Because we come up with new ideas and they get uh, into the mainstream and the economy benefits from them and so forth. So, so but nonetheless, they're black swans. And, and if you want to drive uh, an economy, you want more black swans. So it's the opposite of the homeland security question where you want fewer black swans, you want fewer power outages and floods and hurricanes and uh, nuclear power meltdowns. And in uh, innovation and invention, you want more. And so there are things that you can do on a, um, a social and economic policy level that would actually create more black swans, which is good for society. It's interesting stuff. Uh, congratulations on your uh on this book, the uh, most recent of, of many. And uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Anders. Yeah.